Would you have to leave me? Yeah, my life done change. Who would have thought that? Damn, you never stay. Feeling the change, all in myself, my dear. I'm trying to pay, I'm trying to pay my dear. I started to face, I'm starting to face my face. But I love my pace, I love my pace, I love my pace. Fall, it was a benefit. Cause I've been working through all my shit. I don't ever try to hide. But if you want me, I'm hard to find. Uh, love in the way that you love. I'm breaking it down, I'm breaking it down, I'm running it so far, taking it home. I'm giving too much, oh baby, you cold. Love me slow, kiss me tender. Hello. <clears throat> it's your old pal Jake, and this is Wicked, which stands for We Clean Your Debris. Normally it stands for what you can do, but I thought today, in honor of a day that is for some just a beautiful, snowy Sunday afternoon, I'd read the first chapter of a, of a novel for you, a sci-fi novel. Uh, each chapter is self-contained with a beginning, middle, and end, just like an episode of a TV show. If you find that uh, you enjoy it, I encourage you to leave a like, and if you find that you'd like to hear more, leave a comment in the comment section, and I'll keep it going, chapter two through the end. Uh, I do think there should be free entertainment out there for people, and this is uh, one piece of media that I've decided to make for free. Um, it's going to be, because we're just having fun here, it's going to be a... Uh, Largely audio medium. I won't even be looking at the camera for the majority of it. My my show notes are uh, above the camera, which is where I will have to be reading it from. So put on your favorite uh, podcasting uh, game, uh, Kenshi or Minecraft or Mountain Blade, and uh, or you know clean the house, uh, put it on while you're cooking, do whatever it is you do while you listen to a podcast. Um, let me pull this up. Without further ado, this is Wicked Witch, Chapter 1. We clean your debris, Marco's voice crackled over the comms, shattering the silence that had surrounded the field of dead ships. Killed a convoy of colonists and don't want the Martians to find out. Trying to avoid a corporate war but don't have a lot of money. We clean your debris. Marco could do a voice that nailed the tone and cadence of the commercial Jasmine heard every time she booted up her cleaner's systems, which made his parody of the lines delightful in the hangar bay. As they floated in the outskirts of Cargo King Debris Field, where over a thousand dead were scattered among the shattered ships, it seemed profane. Jasmine snatched up her radio microphone and held it close to her lips, hissing as though being literally quiet would make the signal it sent out less detectable. Calms off, Marco. Witch hasn't given the all clear yet. A voice that made her stomach flutter purred over the comms. That goes for you too, Clean 2. Anyone listening knows Clean 1 isn't alone. And use call signs. We don't want identity thieves mapping us. Jasmine leaned forward in her seat looking through the glass in the pot belly of her cleaner unit at a fighter perched in the shadow of their carrier. Wicked Juan was painted on its hull, on its hull, over a rose. She increased magnification as much as her humble, as much as her humble cleaner could, which was enough to let her see the pilot inside. He was smiling, and Jasmine marveled that she could see how perfectly white and square his teeth were, even with the incredible distance between them. It helped that the visor to his helmet was clear glass, and he didn't have to hold up a microphone to use its built-in communication system. 
A strangely shaped fighter drifted between them. Although it was a custom build, more angular than the cleaners or the fighters of the standard fleet, it was identifiable as their ally by the wicked witch painted on the side. The pilot's helmet did not show her face, but the way she hung upside down in front of Wicked Juan for a moment gave the impression of a glare, and her message was clear. Now they know the cleaners have an escort. Hush. A spurt of side and bottom jets sent the custom ship darting away at an odd angle, and Wicked Witch disappeared into the blackness between the stars. Finally back in silence, the fighter squad drifted forward, and Jasmine looked at the job site. Marco, cleaner one, had not been far off the mark. A convoy of some sort had been smashed to bits on the outskirts of space claimed by Luna, but reports seemed certain splatnets were to blame. The convoy was probably led by an inexperienced captain who failed to decelerate below the net's detection threshold, and as a result had set off the systems designed to place objects in the path of runaway ships. Whether that was the cause of the initial destruction or not, the convoy had been traveling too close together and unstaggered, so that whatever caused the doom of the first ship had also guaranteed the fate of the rest in a chain reaction that must have been, mercifully, quick. The rust-painted hunks of metal ranged in size from as small of, as grains of sand to as large as stadiums, and they filled Jasmine's forward view screen even without magnification. The bulk of the scrap might be fed to their hauler in a day, but it would take several more of dragging the field with magnets before the spaceway could be declared clear. And so, mindful of the bonuses that could be found in scrapping wreckage, Jasmine picked out the hulks that would best serve as a gathering point. Three of them, attracted by their own mass, had started the job naturally. One of them was unrecognizable from what it had been, now just a twisted mountain of metal still glowing from some internal reaction that had yet to burn out. The biggest and smallest hulk of the three appeared to be the front and back end of a ship that had split in half. For a moment, Jasmine held on to the hope that someone might have survived in the wreckage, perhaps by sealing off a room before the oxygen escaped, so she increased magnification to have a look inside. As the three hulks slowly spun, the inside of the larger front half was revealed, and she let that hope die. Chunks of viscera floated among the dinner plates, bolts, sparking wires, and other carnage of the crash. She switched off magnification, then reached over to the panel by her armrest and typed out the observation for the smelting team. The fighters glided around the debris field, dipping in here and there to check the other side of a particularly large chunk of wreckage, but never straying far enough away that they couldn't swarm to each other's aid if the need arose. Although the field was dozens of kilometers wide at its narrowest, the fighters were built for battles in the infinite expanse, and so completed their check in only a few minutes. Juan's voice came over the general con channel when the fighters had confirmed no ruff ruffians were awaiting in ambush. Cleaners, you are clear to clean. Wicked Team One will tag along as escort. A cold feeling crept over Jasmine. She looked around frantically, then saw what she least wanted. While the five fighters that made up the made up a third of the Wicked Fleet stood ready, the red glow of the custom-built fighter's engine was growing smaller in the distance, looking like a flickering star. Hoping to spare the team's pride, she switched to the comm channel labeled Witch. Uh, that's Wicked Team One and Wicked Witch, right? To her embarrassment, Witch responded on a channel that included everyone but Wicked Wan, which Jasmine still had in her system as Delroy. Contract's up in a month, and we've got two other teams to get ready. Do what Wicked Wan says, and remember, you've got a carrier to retreat to if the worst comes to pass. Wicked Two's voice came over the general comm. Who's complaining? Delroy shot down a dust devil last week. There was silence over the comms, during which Jasmine wanted to crawl into her suit. Robbie's parents were both cleaners, so, assuming he would do the same his whole life, he hadn't even signed up for the fighter program when the company rolled it out. 
Yet Delroy recommended him anyway, and in doing so, Head gained a semi-capable and eternally loyal squad mate. He had jumped to defend the reputation of his beloved squad leader, but in doing so, Head alerted the man to the fact that nearly everyone else doubted it. Worse, he picked a feat that had brought Delroy, Wicked Juan, more ridicule than praise. Dueling was technically forbidden by most companies, yet they generally also had code words they used to list the cause of damage as something other than what it was. Wicked, however, had too few fighter pilots to lose even one needlessly. Having one of their skilled pilots engage in a duel would not only risk the pilot and the fighter, but also made it harder for weaker pilots to deny a duel. Jasmine switched to the general comm to try to save the situation. We know, but if something happens, don't you want to see if he's better than which? I could answer that now. Absolutely not, said Delroy with a laugh. Delroy guffawed when someone caught him off guard with a comment he found funny, and the light chuckle he gave now was what Jasmine had heard those few times a woman had said no to him in the lounge. It was usually preceded by something incredibly charming, like, Just my luck. I'm attracted to smart gals, but they're too smart to date me. Besides, he said, she's right. If Wicked is going to stop bleeding out half our profit paying mercs, we're going to need... We're going to be all there is. Best start now. Cleaner 2, you looking at the three sisters over there? Asked Marco, mercifully moving the conversation along. The cluster with two halves of a broken ship? Yeah, that's probably our best center point. I guess it is. Good eyes. Looks like the spread rate isn't too bad. You want to do a salvage run before we bury it? She had until she saw the bodies. Although she claimed to have gone numb to the sight, secretly it still broke her heart to get close enough to see the terror frozen into the faces of those that died after the impact in a big crash. But a crash that left some alive to die of exposure also meant a salvage bonus was more likely. Let's do it. She and the other nine in her squad fired the back jets on their cleaners, sending them drifting towards the space hulks like a swarm of jellyfish. Slow as the cleaners moved, she still felt the force of momentum drag back at her. It was as though a moon's worth of gravity was suddenly pulling her against her seat. It was hard for her to comprehend how the fighter pilots managed to stay conscious when moving as fast as they did, never mind the neck-snapping speeds at which the best sometimes changed directions. The hulks growing in her screens were like Christmas presents spotted under the spacesuits in the closet. But she resisted the temptation to peek in and struck and stuck to her role. Soon, she spotted the first danger. Got a big chunk of debris coming in from starboard. Course adjustment needed. Marco made a purring noise over the comm. Mm, think we can slow it? A smile crept up Jasmine's cheek. We'd have to be damn good. You heard her, cleaners. Slow by fifteen and get your mags ready. As one of the forward thrusters flickered just enough that the sparking chunk of hull would pass in front of them. As one, the forward thrusters flickered just enough that the sparking chunk of hull would pass in front of them, and they raised the chunky arms of their vehicles up. Flicking a switch above her head, two joysticks raised from the compartments in, at the front of her armrests. She slid her arms through leather loops and when she took hold of the joysticks, the locks holding the armrests in place released, giving her full control over the cleaner's chunky appendages. Don't clap on, just ease it down, said Marco, mostly to himself. He had left his channel open to, the direct, the squad, to direct the squad as he used both hands to operate his own cleaner. Slow it down way more, let's say by twenty-five. It was hard for new pilots to make such small adjustments with the foot pedals, particularly on the bulky cleaners, but there was no worry that the squad would have any trouble with it even if the declaration was enough to make Jasmine's stomach lurch. Another ten. Good eyes, cleaner two. I see it now. Take off another five, cleaner six. Slow as smooth, smooth as fast. Jasmine mouthed the familiar last line, having heard it a great deal from Marco when she was learning to pilot 
the humanoid vehicles. Travis, piloting Cleaner 6, fell in line with the rest just as the debris entered their path. It looked thick enough that Jasmine began to doubt whether they would have enough time to stop it without having to chase after it. But when she glanced over, she saw Justine in Cleaner 4 wiggling her eyebrows back at her, and she couldn't help but grin. All right, let's make a loop. Tight orientation. The cleaners formed a ring with their heads in the center, keeping their arms out towards the debris. Okay, ease up on mags till you feel it catch, then hold. The electromagnets in, their ar- in the arms of their cleaners whirred to life. Jasmine almost immediately felt herself lurch forward. The debris slowed, but it was so close that she wondered for a moment if they might clamp on accidentally. Yet, just as the magnetic force pulled her closer, it passed by. As they started to pass it, the magnetic attraction turned their vehicles toward it as one. Cut mags! As one, the cleaners released the debris from their pole. It spun around slowly now, but was on a slow course towards the cluster of wreckage they had designated as their center point. Travis shouted over the comms, Folks, that's what the kids call finesse, and damned if we don't got it! Travis's praise was met with a chorus of cheers over the general comms, though they had saved themselves only a few minutes of work. The pride they felt was its own reward. The cleaner looked like specks of sand against the hulks as they landed upon the the outer hull. Already the mass of the hulks had attracted smaller scrap that now clung to them as they twisted through space. Cleaner 2 and I are going to sweep this big half. Cleaner 3 and 6, make your way over to the other side and sweep the interior of the small half. 5, lay cutting lines around the nose of the big one, and 4, you do the same around the small. Justine turned Cleaner 4 from looking out over the sea of debris. Marco, I doubt we have enough line to close a loop around the nose. Forget about actually getting through the hull. It'll take multiple trips for sure, he conceded. But no reason we can't start now. And while you're at it, you can see if anything valuable is clinging to the hull. Keep a lookout for intact computers. You never know. With a pleased growl, Justine switched on her scanner, sending one of the lenses in Cleaner 4's head flickering green, then pushed off for the nose. The rest followed suit, heading in their respective roles along the carcasses. Through the glass of his cockpit, Jasmine saw Marco switch his radio to default open, then clip the microphone next to him instead of hanging it up. How many thousands of hours, she wondered, had they talked about life like that? It was with that very radio arrangement that he had told her about his own adventures training under her parents, filling in her mind the image of the old days, with an older brother's knowledge of the gossip the adults had hidden from her. Over the personal channel, he said, Are you ready? Jasmine did the same with her radio, but gave a response only by twitching her foot against the pedal to send her cleaner drifting towards the ragged maw of the Hulk. She normally would have liked the chat, but she didn't want Marco to hear her yelp if she got surprised by a particularly nasty sight. Sure. You got something you want to talk about? Why are we leaving comms open? As he followed Jasmine, Marco said, Two reasons, the heebies and the jeebies. I wouldn't mind a little chit-chat as we delve. It had been a manufacturing ship of some kind, though what it made wasn't clear. If they had made something of high enough quality, Jasmine doubted they would be in a convoy that was so poorly piloted. In fact, she doubted they would be set up anywhere other than a factory in a permanent orbit around something, but... As the cleaners drifted toward into the sundered cafeteria, there seemed to be too much room for it to have been the home of low-wage workers. Cups, half-eaten sandwiches, chunks of wall, and severed limbs drifted by as they pushed farther in. Jasmine tried to take her mind off the people. There's sparks coming off some of these hanging wires. Some power must still be on. Are, Are the doors working? Marco made his way over to one and, with a little effort, got one of the three fat fingers on his cleaner's hand to press the open button. It creeped aside, sluggishly answering the request. Looks like it. Hey! 
Marco disappeared into the hall. For a moment, Jasmine resisted the urge to ask him what he saw, but she could no longer after he said, What the hell? What? She floated towards him. Somebody's bolted to the wall. What? Jasmine shouldered him over, the bulk of their cleaners filling the corridor. At the end of it, by the door, was the body of a man. Giant bolts of the kind used for emergency repairs in spaceships or for in-atmosphere construction had been used in this case to pin the man in several places to the wall like a butterfly. By the look of frozen agony on his face, Justine assumed the bolts had been what killed the man, rather than the unfortunate accident as bodies and tools bounced around the crash. Wicked Juan, heads up, said Marco, temporarily switching over to the general channel. It looks like there was some fighting here in the big ship. Somebody got killed with a bolt gun, of all things. Understood. Is anybody left alive in there? I doubt it. Maybe just keep your head on a swivel. Head swiveling. Switching back to their private channel, Marco's eyes met Jasmine's. You too. Jasmine kicked off, heading towards the opposite corridor. Head swiveling. Lights flickered on and off. As the ship occasionally tried to pump atmosphere to the crew sections that no longer existed, a wave of air would bring the sound of a blaring alarm with it. Seeing the murdered man, however, somehow brought down Jasmine's nerves. It was worse than she had expected to see, and she had braced herself for the sight of dead children. But the people had caused their own demise, it seemed, and she lost much of her sympathy for them. She realized to her shame that one of the things she had been most afraid of was finding someone alive. Of course, she would have done everything she could to help them, but the experience of trying to get some traumatized person, or even a child, back to their carrier, where they would most likely die in agony anyway as a result of whatever injuries they took in the crash, had been what she was most afraid of. Now, however, she was sure they were all dead, if not by the crash, then by whatever foul coup had taken place. When a new gust of atmosphere blew over Jasmine's cleaner, something about the alarm caught her as odd. She turned her mag arm to the wall and switched it on, planting herself next to a speaker. With her own reserves full, she felt confident pressing the vent and manual refill buttons at once, sending a cloud of air around her and the speaker. It's jazz! What is? Jasmine lingered by the speaker until it was undeniable. A saxophone was blaring happily, as if the whole crew was still enjoying a party rather than floating in a mass of viscera. She pushed her cleaner down the corridor. There's jazz playing through the speakers. What's going on here? Maybe it's best not to find out. I've got some smashed up construction exoskeletons over here. Weird, but not valuable. See anything on your side? Yeah, I'm looking at the door to an exoskeleton bay. Bay 10, Jasmine said, looking at the flickering sign above double doors. If some are still working, maybe the engineers can wipe the ownership software. The loaders on the Condor are more ad adapter kits than normal parts at this point. Okay, I'll make my way to the bridge. If they held on to their licenses for anything we find, it'll be there. Understood. Be safe. She didn't know why she had said the last part, because with each passing moment, she was more certain that no one had survived the impact. Whatever fight had taken place, she assumed, had caused the crash, which had killed them all. Still, she was glad she said it, and she felt comforted when Marco said, Ballet. It had evolved from U2 Cleaner 2 to U2 2, then 2 2, and had threatened to become a nickname before Jasmine got ways by default in taking on mapping responsibilities. Although Jasmine was able to maneuver her cleaner to press to the button to open the door, it only slid open a few minutes at a, t a few inches at a time, in sync with when the sign flickered. For a moment, she considered sealing her helmet and using the emergency crank embedded in the wall, but a glob of congealed blood smeared across the angular glass cockpit, and she decided she would rather remain in the machine. She placed the cleaner's hands on either door and cranked the magnets way up. 
the hands securely clamped down to the metal and slowly, so as to avoid unnecessary wear on the gears, she spread the arms wide. The doors crept apart, revealing a mound of twisted metal on the other side. At first she was amazed that the door had held up against the force by which the debris must have been flung into it, but then her cleaner's arms could move the door no farther apart, and she knew that she had only been so she had not been so lucky. The space where the doors slid into the wall had been smashed in. All was not necessarily lost, however. Jasmine strummed her fingers on the side of her armrest for a moment as she thought about how she might get the loaders out. The doors were halfway open, not enough of a gap for her cleaners to squeeze through, but large enough for a loader if she could move the debris. Its mass would be too much for her to move, particularly if some of that debris was stuck in the wall, but a thought occurred to her that made her smirk. There was a gap between beams she could fit through, and if she was doubly lucky, she might find a loader exoskeleton with power in it and no security check at startup. It was hard to judge from the state of the ship whether the crew had been the sort to stringently follow security precautions. A glance at her cleaner's energy reserves, now dipping beneath full, told her that she had to either look it, look for herself or move on. She opened her mouth to tell Marco to forget about the loaders, but the thought of explaining that she was too afraid to leave her cleaner made her instead say, I'm going to do a quick spacewalk to check out these loaders. Gotcha, said Marco. I'm about halfway up the bridge. The hull's thicker up here, so if we lose radio, then wait for me outside the hulk, okay? Understood. Jasmine pulled her helmet down until it lined up with the ring of her gorget, then pulled the latches closed. The suit's finicky system once again decided that normal air pressure was just enough to make it feel like a toddler was pinching her nose, which gave her comfort that it was working at least and concern that it may decide not to as the whim took it. She disengaged the dozen safeties that her cleaner required to ensure that the pilot genuinely meant to open the cockpit in a void, including typing the words helmet seal confirmed, and then, with only a little hesitation, flipped the final switch. With a great whoosh, the glass retracted. When she unbuckled her belt, the gust lifted her out toward the gap in the pile of debris. She reached a hand out to steady herself against the metal, but pulled it back in fright. She saw a, she saw a hanging wire on the, other side of, on the other side, sparking as it brushed against the debris. Yet when she stru stuck a leg back to try to stop herself, she felt her toes slide uselessly over the control console. With no way to stop, she crossed her arms over her chest and straightened herself out to make herself as narrow as possible. She twisted her head to the side, hoping she guessed the right angle to fit through without making contact. Drifting through the tunnel of debris, Jasmine saw the sign above the doors splash her cleaner with yellow light, trying and failing to come to life in intervals of a few seconds. From inside the tunnel, she could see the spaces between the debris as well, which flickered with blue with which flickered blue with electricity arcing between the pieces nearest each other but only when the entrance sign powered on jasmine waited for the sign to flicker on then let it run through its light show as soon as it stopped she grabbed two firm looking chunks of metal and pulled herself through the gap she glided free of the debris tunnel gracefully spinning and letting the slight magnetic pull on her boots guide her to the ground. Loader exoskeletons stood ready in charging stations on either side of a narrow room that was tall enough for the loaders to be stacked too high. Each time the power surged in the room, green ready lights flashed above the loaders, then flickered out before they could start up properly. The find had been worth the effort. Although she couldn't recognize the manufacturer, Jasmine recognized the disks that were affixed above the pilot's seat as simple AI units, so that routine tasks could be done by the exoskeletons without a human in control. Even better, when the power surged, it looked like they were trying to boot up without requesting a startup code, so she would be bringing back a legion of tireless workers for the Condor. 
Considering the staffing shortage, the loaders were worth more to the company, and therefore her bonus, than the rest of the scrap combined. A flash caught Jasmine's attention. She saw the debris by the door was a collection of panels, beams, and pipes torn away from some vital structure, and thrust so hard that many of them pierced the wall. One long girder was leaning against the wall, pinned by a collection of impaled bars near its base, with its top pressing against a long cable. The cable was half-severed, shorting its circuit against the girder, with a cloud of sparks each time the room tried to boot up its systems. The girder was exacerbating the problem, which might solve itself if she could move it. If. Jasmine kicked off the ground. She floated towards the girder, snatching a sturdy chunk of pipe floating in her path and readying it like a baseball bat. She tightened her grip, keeping her eye on the sparks, and when they cut off for a moment, she swung. Her whole arm jerked with the impact, which knocked the girder loose and sent her bumping against the wall. All at once the room came to life. The overhead lights flickered on, showing her that there was a cloud of smaller debris bouncing around the room. The ready lights ceased flickering on the docking stations, and, starting with the far door, they started a proper boot up, one at a time. She decided to crawl back into her cleaner to radio Marco right away, but when she turned back to the cluster of debris, she saw that her strike had deformed it, and the tunnel she had used to get in was now gone. For a moment she considered pulling it free by hand, but shuddered when she thought of how bad things might go if she tore her suit on one of the jagged scraps. How long could she hold her breath? She tried every time a character did in the movies, and never made it past two minutes. Of course, her suit was a sturdy thing, if not fancy. Built in the days of regulations, it could be, certainly, relied upon. But it was older than Jasmine herself and warranties, when they had existed, had a limit for a reason. There was, of course, the exit on the other end of the loader bay, but the idea of getting lost without a radio in a ship set to be demolished flashed through her mind and she discarded it. If it came to it, she would be dug out by Marco when, they, when he activated her cleaner's emergency beacon. Still, that assumed he would remember to check it before her suit's oxygen ran out, which she herself had forgotten to do a few times when leading the B-team. Jasmine swore she would never let that happen again. Fortunately, one at a time, the answer to her problem was booting up. First the bottom loader on the far end, then the one above it, then the one next to it, then the one above that, and so on down the line. When all had booted up, she reckoned, the controls would be released and she could use the thing's massive pincers to clear the way. She pushed herself into a loader near the debris, taking a few moments to look at the controls. The function of a loader exoskeleton was so simple that the controls were nearly universal, with joysticks inside the arms for controlling the angle of the pincers. She pulled the straps tight that secured her legs, then slid her arms through the loops in the machine's arms that were not unlike her cleaners. The extra strength a loader exoskeleton lent to a worker would have left them lift up to a ton in earth gravity. But in space, they also gave the benefit of industrial strength, magnetic feet, and mass, which would allow her to rip away the debris as though it were foil. A silhouette appeared in the doorway, leading to the unknown parts of the ship. It was someone in a spacesuit, and they braced themselves against the doorway to look inside with rigid alarm. It might have made Jasmine happy to see someone had survived, except that they held a massive bolt gun and carried a satchel stuffed with bolt magazines strapped to their back. There was a wire tied to the safety catch on the nozzle of the bolt gun, holding it back to let the gun fire off bolts without pressing against a surface. The newcomer kicked into the room, and, before Jasmine could reach her hand up to gesture that she came in peace, they opened fire. The only sound Jasmine heard was her own shrieks as the gunner tore through the line in front of her, Sturdy as the loaders were, the bolts were sent flying with a force meant to bind buildings together, 
and so each was methodically shredded. The force of the bolt gun was such that it was bouncing the gunner around as they fired. Despite the fact that the gun was sized to be used with an exoskeleton, they were able to keep most shots on target. A few, though, went wild, chewing up the walls and flying straight through pipes that in turn sprayed coolant around in great wobbling gobs. Bouncing against the wall, the gunner ejected at the magazine and fed in a new one. It was in this moment that, he, that they seemed to notice Jasmine, who was waving frantically in, for want of a better plan. But then the loader straightened in its dock, and they began firing down the line again. Jasmine darted her eyes around until she found a control screen for her loader in the form of a panel over her arm. She ignored a dozen flashing error message. messages, likely having to do with the rapidly decreasing number of friendly signals detected, until she found the boot progress. 98%. She looked up and saw that the gunner was chewing down the line, going up and down and managing to destroy the loaders just as each was coming to life. Jasmine shot her eyes back to the loader's control panel. 99%. The loader next to it came apart in a flurry of bolts, sending glittering chunks of metal and globs of oil spattering against her helmet. She felt the dock rumble, as the loader above her was destroyed. Jasmine pulled her arm free of the loops, yanked the straps off her feet, and dived forward. She bounced off the ground and would have been carried to the opposite wall by her momentum, but she jerked to a stop in midair. She looked at her feet and saw the loader leaning out of its docking bay, its AI active, with its pincer clamped on the fabric of her spacesuit. Then it seemed to dance, shivering as it leaned this way and that under the hail of construction bolts. Perhaps it had meant to stop her from colliding with the wall, but whatever oddities of the machine's AI that had made it reach out for Jasmine were undone when a bolt passed through its control disc and it released her leg. Now hovering dangerously exposed above the ground, Jasmine did not give the gunner the opportunity for a second volley at her. She snatched a chunk of paneling and slapped a bucket's worth of oil at them. The oil slapped into their visor and, with no gravity to drag it down, simply clung to it. The gunner frantically swiped at their visor, but they couldn't clear it before Jasmine closed the distance. She took the gunner by the shoulders and drove her knee into their crotch, hoping there was something painful to present, something painful present to crunch. There was, and Jasmine did not wait to see how bad she'd hurt them. She got between the gunner and the exit and planted her feet on, into their back, kicking off of them to send the gunner toward the pile of jagged debris and herself into the foreign corridor. Jasmine grabbed the frame of the door as she passed through it, angling herself down the corridor and leaping from one wall to another to propel herself away. There are arcways every twenty feet or so, meant to both lend structure to the corridors and to give travelers something to propel themselves with when the ship was still. She doubted she had killed the gunner, but if she had, she didn't want to go back into the room to see it. Most likely, she expected she would be chased, so either way, her first priority was to create distance. The direction she was heading seemed to run parallel with the corridor she had taken on the other side of the ship. But that had a few turns in it, and the turns she came to now felt like they were in different places. She looked for a corridor on her right that may link them, but every opening led only to more rooms that were too dark to see into. Then, on a particularly long jump, she dared to check behind her. She saw only an empty corridor, except for the occasional piece of trash floating by. Jasmine considered that, since Exoskeleton Loading Bay 2 had two entrances. Jasmine considered that, since Exoskeleton Loading Bay 10 had two entrances. Surely another large room would open to the other side as well. She came to a big double door under a label that read Cold Storage and entered into a room that was a promising candidate, though it was too dark to see to the other side. Although the room was long and wide, she had barely enough space to fit between the racks of shelves that filled it. The shelves were full of boxes that had food labels slapped on them, many of which had burst apart on impact and sent food packs floating freely around the room. 
A package of potential carrot soup bounced off her helmet, and she pulled herself down the racks, guided only by the light from the open doorway. She was given hope as her eyes adjusted to the dark. Still some distance off, she could see the end of the room and the square shape with rounded corners that matched all the doorways she had seen so far. Suddenly, Jasmine's shadow was eclipsed, and she pulled herself up and onto a shelf. Peering down at the new shadow, she saw it shrink and take on a more solid shape, but it was not the form of a man. A loader entered cold, cold storage, walking between the shelves with its magnetic feet clinging easily in a steady gait. Jasmine assumed that it was attending to some regularly programmed task, like taking a load of food to the galley to be made into dinner, ignorant of how irrelevant it was now that the crew was dead. Something told her, though, to stay hidden from the machine. Jasmine pushed herself further into the darkness, to the next shelves over, then up one. She kept her eyes on the machine and gasped when it stopped at the place where she had been a moment ago. It craned its body up, but when it did not st spot her among the shelves, it seemed to lose interest and continued down the line. Jasmine gripped the side of the shelf, though she wasn't sure if she should pull herself the remaining distance to the exit on the side she hoped might lead to her cleaner, or begin working her way back the longer way toward the door she and the loader exos exoskeleton had come in. She watched the loader begin to go up and down in a gap between the rows of shelves, and when its back was to her, she made the decision. With a mighty yank, she propelled herself down the aisle, flying towards the closed door to her cleaner. Although it had disappeared into the darkness, Jasmine could not take her eyes off where she had last seen the loader, hoping to confirm that it was still searching the wrong area if she was indeed what it was looking for. As a result, she did not see the cluster of frozen meat packs floating between the shelves until it was too late to stop herself from plowing into them. She bounced off and was able to grab onto the shelf to reposition, but they bounced away, and so many of them smacked into floating foods on other shelves until her kinetic energy had transformed into a cloud of bouncing foodstuffs in the aisle nearest her. Jasmine stayed frozen clinging to the shelf with one hand and, unthinkingly, a stake in the other. She peered into the darkness, looking for some sign that would mean the loader hadn't noticed her mistake. The loader emerged into the light, a cloud of food packs bouncing off of it as it leapt directly for her, its pincers outstretched. She hurled the stake, more to free her hands than to harm the thing, and pulled herself toward the other side of the shelf. An instant later, she saw the shelves being crumpled together under the power of the loader's pincer and then saw that the whole shelving unit warp and bend as it bashed one arm over the other down to create a gap the machine could squeeze through. Jasmine passed through two more shelves, though the time it took the great machine to rip through them was barely more than it took her to maneuver around the boxes of food. She began ripping them open as she weaved through, which led the loader which let the loader close most of the distance, but also meant that the air became clouded with debris as the machine's massive attacks sent the unsecured packets flying. She had only one shelf to go before she would hit the wall, and when she saw what she had hoped for, she had only one shelf to go before she would hit the wall when she saw what she had hoped for. Ripping off a seal, Jasmine pulled out two boxes of powdered milk and hurled them. When they impacted against the loader, the thing was covered in a fog of white. She pulled herself toward the closed door, unwilling to risk trying to get around the loader to go back to the light, and unsure if the path was even clear anymore. Arriving at the door, she let the magnets on her boots bring her to the ground and hit the open button. Nothing happened. The wail she let loose in her helmet was so piteous that she briefly appreciated its lack of a built-in communication system, disregarding the fact that she had been angry at its absence only minutes before. She dashed to the side and found a circular panel in the wall by the door. Once, these panels had been mandatorily designed the same way, so that anyone would know how to use them in an emergency. 
Either this ship was built in those days, or the manufacturer hadn't found a cheaper way to check off a box that would let them say they'd put emergency mechanical releases on their door. Grateful for whichever the cause had been, she reached in and turned the bar that would, open, that would pull the door open. There was nothing physically preventing the door from opening besides the lack of power, but it was still a massive thing to move by hand. As she turned the crank, released it, and turned it again, a line of light appeared in the growing space between the doors. It was not nearly enough to squeeze through, and a glance over her shoulder showed her what she least wanted to see. The loader had seen the light, and its AI was just competent enough to cause it to turn and investigate. It was coming right for her. Jasmine wailed again and cranked the handle. She thought she had perhaps ten seconds, but after only a few cranks, she she glanced again and saw that the end had arrived. The loader had spotted her, raised its pincer, and was about to bring it down on her head. She used the grip on the handle to fling herself to the ground, determined to keep trying to survive, if only to make her killer's life a little harder, though even as she slammed into the hard floor she expected to be crushed by a strike from the evil machine. Instead, when she looked up, she saw it jitter as a flurry of bolts ripped through it and dug into the steel of the door. Sparks and oil sprayed out of the thing and flared up in those few places they touched wisps of oxygen. The gunner slammed into the wall on the opposite side of the door and tore at the emergency panel there. Their bolter was slung over their shoulder and they feverishly began turning the crank. They paused only to gesture wildly for her to keep cranking as well and Jasmine looked beyond the sparking corpse of the loader to see why. A cluster of the machines were bounding down cold storage, ripping up whole shelving units and tossing them aside where they impeded progress. Jasmine did not need more encouragement. She scrambled to her feet and turned the crank on her side. The doors pulled farther and farther apart until there was a space just big enough for a helmet to fit through. The gunner stopped cranking, and they unslung their bolt gun. And as they unslung their bolt gun, Jasmine thought they might foolishly be turning to make a final stand. Instead, they tossed the gun through the gap, then disengaged the oxygen pack on their back. Seeing the play, Jasmine undid hers as well. As soon as the hose disengaged from the back of her helmet, a red light flashed a warning above her eye. I know, she growled, though there was no voice command to turn it off. She shoved her pack through the gap in the doors, then followed it. Instead of the gunner, she was followed by several oxygen packs. In the light of the corridor, she could barely make out what the hellish room she had. Ju- she could barely make out what was in the hellish room she had just escaped. But she could see the gunner pulling the packs out of his satchel and shoving them through the door. Then she could see the loaders bounding towards them. She slammed her hand against the door, but of course they did not hear. Their fate seemed so sealed that Jasmine did not feel bad for opening the the emergency panel on the other side, intent on sealing the way through. The gunner dashed through the gap, having abandoned their satchel and firing the bolt gun at where they had just been. There was a flash, and then they were slammed against the wall. A moment later, Jasmine heard a brief pop that could only have come from multiple days' worth of oxygen tanks bursting in unison, then disappearing into the void. Even through the narrow gap, the blast pushed everything away from the doors, including the oxygen tanks that they had taken care to push through. Jasmine decided she would not worry about that in 40 seconds. Jasmine decided that she would worry about that in 40 seconds, when the air within her helmet would no longer be enough to keep her alive. For now, she worried only about what would kill her in 30 seconds. Not bothering to check on the gunner, Jasmine twisted the crank until the door on her side was fully closed, then dashed to the other side and did the same. She felt a satisfying clunk, but before she released the handle, she felt it vibrate and saw lumps forming in the door as the surviving loaders tried to bore through. Snatching the bolt gun from the corner between the ceiling and the wall where it had become wedged, she leveled it at the doors. A better thought came to mind when she glanced at the gunner, whose limp body had come to rest against a collection of wall panels that had come loose. 
She snatched one of the panels and tried to press it against the door, though it had so much mass that when she tried to maneuver it too quickly, the magnetic field of her boots was not enough to keep her still, and she slid uselessly along the floor. Then suddenly it snapped into place. The gunner was on their feet and holding the other end of the panel. They nodded for her to continue, and Jasmine bolted two corners of the panel into the door frame. She tossed the bolt gun back to the gunner, then, and they, pulled, and they bolted their two corners, before turning to look for an oxygen tank. Jasmine did the same, and she found a few that were designed for the gunner's suit. Her own, however, had disappeared in the corridor. The gunner saw this as well. They snatched a pair of packs, shoving their arms to the straps of one and then pressing their, presenting their back to Jasmine. She took the hose and plugged, it in, and plugged its nozzle into the back of the gunner's helmet, giving it two light taps to signify she was done. Immediately, she felt their fingers close around her wrist, and they leapt with her, in tow, down the corridor. They passed rooms and maneuvered around debris as Jasmine tried to ignore the, fr the flashing red light inside her helmet. She felt her fingers tingle, then her toes, then her cheeks. For a moment she despaired that they were passing into a section of the Hulk that had no lights, like the cold storage, but she realized, without relief, that the darkness was from her vision dimming. Black crept in, more and more, as she sucked in air that did less with each breath. All at once she jerked to a stop. She barely felt it when the gunner tossed her into a small room. Latch undone, please reseal. Latch undone, please reseal. Latch, the warning shouted within her helmet, made her slap at the gunner's hands around her neck. But there was no strength in her blows. She tried to make her mind work, to come up with a better strategy, but it was so foggy that she could barely remember where she was. Then the cold rushed over her and into her. Instantly the breath was pulled out of her mouth and nose, and her suit was clinging to every inch of her body except the front where the gunner was tearing it open. She tried to kick them, but her limbs were hardly moving now, and instead she sunk into unconsciousness. When she awoke, she thought she was covered in grease. Looking down, however, she saw that she had been crammed into a suit that was made of a silky material that clung to her body. It was slowly filling with air, just as she was slowly waking up. Looking around, she saw that she was in a little room full of lockers. All were open, and a few suits were missing, as well as all of the oxygen tanks that should have been with them. Now she knew how the gunner had survived for days in a hulk that had no atmosphere. The gunner was replacing their magazine, and, when they noticed her waking, they pointed to their bolt gun. With their free hand, they held up one finger, then five. Jasmine held up one hand and spread her fingers wide, then made a fist, then repeated the gesture twice more. The gunner nodded. Fifteen rounds left. Jasmine looked around for anything with a keyboard, but saw none. She would have taken an old-fashioned marker at that point, but seeing none, she insisted. She instead tried to think of how she might communicate that they needed to get back to the loader bay where she had first seen, where they had first seen each other. When she did an impression of the meeting, the gunner only stared at her. She tried again, miming a loader walking, waking up in its dock but the gunner interrupted her by pointing to the dial on her new suit. It said she had 20 minutes to breathe. Apparently the, ox apparently, the good oxygen tanks had been lost back in cold storage. If they scrambled for an exit, they might be found by her crew, but she doubted they would be spotted in time. Even if she found a flashlight to signal with, and even if they were actively looking for her, She'd be one of a thousand points of flashing light in the sparking, burning, spinning wreckage. Struck with inspiration, Jasmine mimed a loader again, exaggerating a clamping motion with her hands. Then she held up a finger on one hand and made a zero with her other. Come on, loader bay ten, understand! The gunner peered at her for a moment. For the first time she could see their eyes dark and intense, through the visor. Those dark eyes shot open in understanding, 
and they did the clamping motion she had used to mean loader, then flashed five fingers on their free hand twice. Jasmine nodded excitedly and rushed after the gunner when they motioned for her to follow. They made their way down a maze of corridors, even poking through a jagged hole between floors to get around a collapsed section, until yellow warning lights were flashing in Jasmine's new helmet to tell her the oxygen was dangerously low. She did not waste, she did not waste the breath to tell it to shut up. Then, as they pulled themselves out of an emergency hatch back onto the floor with her cleaner, they nearly bumped into a group of roaming loaders coming around the corner. Jasmine screamed uselessly for the gunner to look out as the machines as, as a machine turned and swiped at them. It caught them on the back with a blow that sent them flying into Jasmine, and they both bounced down the corridor in a tangle. Both of them regained their senses at once. Jasmine grabbed an arc and the gunner's wrist. The gunner tried to level the bolt gun, but they jerked around erratically. Jasmine saw that the hose connecting their helmet to their oxygen was snapped. Worse, it seemed that these suits did not have a safety valve that closed the passage if a drop in pressure was detected. With the nozzle still plugged in, then, the gunner was venting atmosphere from both their suit and their tank, and when they were being and they were being jerked around by the expelled atmosphere. They tossed the bolt gun to Jasmine, who was too afraid of the horde of incoming loaders to hesitate. She let them go and grabbed the gun, wrapping her fingers around the gigantic handle as the gunner bounced wildly off walls in a losing struggle with their own suit. The first loader went down in three shots, only two of which hit. The force of the bolt gun was such that it flung Jasmine back, ripping her free of her grip on the arc. She went with it and fired five more shots at the loaders, tearing holes through some and increasing her velocity with each shot. Jasmine collided with the gunner at the end of the corridor, not having to look over her shoulder to know they were unconscious. They hardly moved except for a twitch, and suddenly she felt very alone against the tide of machines but there was a button on the wall by the entrance to the corridor they had just been, and Jasmine kicked off the wall to press it with a prayer to fate. She watched in triumph as the door slid closed, then wondered if she had just sealed off the only way back to her cleaner. As the door began to warp under the blows of the machines on the other end, she checked her oxygen. Less than a minute remained. Jasmine looked down either side of the corridor they now occupied and thought it looked familiar just as every one she had been down looked familiar. She told herself that she recognized the, lighting, the lightning bolt-shaped burn mark on the wall, then thought the one on the other wall looked more like the burn mark she remembered on the way in. Then she couldn't remember if she really had seen a burn mark like that on the wall, or if she had only started noticing them after she left the cleaner. Jasmine saw the gunner convulse as their lungs tried to suck in air that was not there. She pulled the nozzle free from the back of her helmet and plugged it into the gunners. For the second time in her life, she saw the red light of a helmet that detected no oxygen input, but she was rewarded as the gunners' eyes fluttered open. They pushed into her, though they hadn't moved their limbs. Jasmine hugged them, bringing their body close to her, and peeked over their shoulder. The gunner's suit was torn in the back, venting oxygen that she was pouring in. With remorse, Jasmine pulled the nozzle out of the gunner's helmet. She had probably just killed herself as well, but, the, but certainly she couldn't save the gunner. The red light in her helmet switched to yellow again, yet she knew it would not stay that way for long. As they drifted apart, the gunner's eyes fluttered, and Jasmine understood the desperation she saw in them. The need to stay alive was a powerful thing, and she respected anyone that fought the last. Now, though, she would have to guess which direction the gunner would have led her, assuming they even meant to go down this corridor to begin with. She wondered what the odds were that she was even near enough to the docking bay that she could make it there in time even if she guessed correctly at every turn that remained. With the destruction, they had been forced to navigate around the hulk. 
With the destruction they had been forced to navigate around, the Hulk had become a maze to her, and she held no illusions that any choice she would make, beginning with left or right, would be anything other than a coin flip. Then she saw the gunner's hand. They had summoned the willpower to point to the left before they lost consciousness again, and now floated in that position, apparently willing to guide the way in death. Jasmine snatched the outstretched arm by the wrist and yanked them after her. It would mean that she would lose twice as much oxygen with each kick, but she didn't bother considering an option she knew she would not take. If she had enough oxygen left in her lungs to make it to the cleaner, the gunner would have enough oxygen in their blood to stay alive until they were inside it. If. The corridor was long, and the lights flickered on and off erratically. The yellow light in her helmet turned red, and she tried not to let it panic her. She felt the wall shake and laughed, thinking for a moment that her co-workers had made all of her efforts to survive irrelevant by deciding to demolish the ship with her inside. She looked back, though, and saw the shaking had come from the door giving way, and the loaders were scrambling over each other to kill her. Jasmine felt her cheeks tingle. Her senses became dull, with the whole mess seeming somehow far off but she hugged the gunner to her chest, pointed the bolt gun at the loaders, and sent off four more shots. It didn't do much to slow down the loaders, but it did plenty to speed up the floating pair of spacers. They skipped off one wall then another as they flew down the corridor. She tried to point the bolt gun in a direction that would stabilize them, but she couldn't figure out which direction that might be and found herself waving the gun in indecision. That indecision was paid for when they slammed into a wall, knocking the last of the air out of her lungs. The darkness was creeping in at the edge of Jasmine's vision again, and the flashing red light seemed to take up most of what else she could see. She didn't bother trying to revive the gunner to ask which way they should go next, since there was no oxygen left to give in the tank. Sleep didn't seem like such a bad way to go, Jasmine caught herself thinking. Desperate to at least go out fighting, she reached out to the wall to try to fling herself in a random direction. In the one-in-a-billion hope, she might guess right, bounce into her lost cleaner, and maybe even bump into the closed canopy button. Except her hand was not on a wall. Her hand, bathed in a sickly yellow light, was on something round. They had come to rest against her cleaner, which still dutifully, held open the doors to Loader Bay 10. A jolt of joy gave her new energy, as well as fear when she tried to climb in. Her limbs were barely moving, and she couldn't feel anything other than pins when she tried to pull herself and the gunner inside. They seemed to creep towards the rim of the cockpit when she meant for them to launch over it. Jasmine felt the ground rumbling. The loaders were still charging down the corridor. Anger was what anger was the fuel Jasmine needed. Focusing all her strength into moving one object at a time, she held the bolt gun up and out as though she were handing it to the cleaner, and then left it hanging there. She lifted the gunner up and shoved them into the cockpit, not caring that they came to rest upside down and on their neck. Finally, with her strength draining and the loaders nearly on them, she pulled herself around the edge of the cockpit, hitting the close button on the way in. The canopy slammed shut. The glorious hiss of air filled the cockpit, and Jasmine did not have time to unlatch the helmet that separated her from it. Shoving her arms through the loops in the armrests, she released the magnetic locks on the cleaner's hands, turned, snatched the bolt gun from where and snatched the bolt gun from where she had left it hanging. The handle had been almost too big for her to wrap her fingers around, but it fit well into the cleaner's hand. She fired the last four shots at a loader's feet, felt the thunk of the bolt gun's hammer hitting itself, and passed out. That was Chapter 1 of Wicked Witch. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this novel is currently about halfway complete and it's expected to be done in about two months. 
If you'd like to hear more, let me know in the comments, and I will, uh, I'll keep on reading. Uh, I enjoy writing as a hobby, and uh, certainly hope to uh, publish this novel and, uh, and a couple of others at a later date. But for now, um, this has been Wicked, which today stands for We Clean Your Debris. It's been your old pal Jake reading. I hope you had a good time. Gucci, yeah, you're worth it, yeah, you're worth it.